I was 16 years old. I was in Nigeria, which is where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. And I was a high school student. I was actually a senior in high school. And that day was a Saturday. It was the final day of the fall semester of uh, 2005. And we were heading home for the Christmas holidays. So when I say we, I mean myself and 60 other students from my high school. I went to a boarding high school. So, um, to get home, we typically have to fly. We fly from, because the school is in a different state from where we live. And so the school group students who live together to travel together. Mm-hmm. So this is the same group of kids that I typically travel with beginning of the semester and the end. So it was nothing unusual to be on the flight that day or to fly just in general. So that day was a regular Saturday. I remember it just being a very normal day. I don't remember anything weird. I Remember, we left the school campus on the school buses. We got to the airport. We boarded the plane eventually. And there were 109 passengers in total. So it was 61 students from my school, including myself and other random passengers. It was a regular commercial flight, including the flight crew. So um, the plane took off. Everything was fine. The the journey is typically an hour and a half. Um, And I remember for for most of it, it was very uneventful, just like any regular flight should be. And then... um. The turbulence started when we started descending, you know, um, when the pilot makes the announcement that we will start the descent, that's when the turbulence started. And again, at this point, there was nothing to be worried about because turbulence is a part of flying. It's not a big deal. But then this one just started to get really bad and just very, very dramatic and exaggerated. And I just remember the tension rising, you know, in the cabin and no one was saying a word because, you know, no one wanted to be the one to to say what we're all thinking because it felt like something was going wrong. And that's the scariest thing to contemplate when you're like in the air. And then a woman from the back of the plane just kind of screamed. And I remember that was when like the chaos just ensued. It wasn't like anyone was running around or anything or strapped in, but like people started screaming, like crying out to God, praying at the top of their lungs and just shouting, Holy Spirit, shouting Jesus. And I remember just sitting there in my seat, like just confused and shocked because I I couldn't quite understand that this was reality. You know, this is the kind of thing you see in movies. It just felt so surreal in that moment. I was in an aisle seat and on the aisle seat next to mine was one of my best friends. And my last memory in that plane is holding her hand. And I remember, I remember just, just waiting for whatever was going to happen to happen. And then there was this this loud metal scraping sound that kind of like jars your brain. Like, you know, like it's like it's like inside your head. And then darkness. It was just dark. Just at, at that point, I, I'm guessing that was impact. Um, but then my most vivid memory after that is opening my eyes and I was horizontal in the hospital bed and five weeks had passed and I was waking up from a coma in South Africa, in a hospital in South Africa. And that was pretty much the beginning of a whole different kind of life. You know, um, I learned that I sustained third degree burns over 65% of my body, which just means that everything from my head to my feet burned except for my torso. And um, thus began my journey as a burn survivor. One of the wise things, you know, I really believe I'm a mom, but that your mom did for you in that season, you know, she held back the truth of the impact of the accident. So she let you, you know, believe and and on advice of counselors, right? So that your resilience would stay high, um, that everyone had survived the accident. But the reality is, uh, you know, 107 people had perished and 60 of those people were your friends. Yeah. And um, eventually they had to tell you. And in that moment when, you know, four or five months out of your, uh, as you're waking up and you've recovered now, in that moment of finding out the actual um, depth of the loss of that accident, what was that like? It was completely life-changing. Like, as if I was not already currently living in a life-changing moment, it was like my whole world had once again turned upside down because it was not at all what I expected. Like, I, this was not what I thought was the reality Mm -hmm. up until that moment, I thought everyone was alive except maybe one person who I had been like in the beginning, they kind of tested the waters and told me that one person, you know, didn't make it. And that broke me so much that I guess at that point they realized I was not ready for the truth of the entire situation. Mm -hmm. So when they eventually told me, I just was confused because 
I thought up until that point that I had gotten the worst of it among everyone that else that survived, which is everyone. I thought I was just one of the worst cases where I was really badly hurt and I was in the hospital. But like most of every, like I just assumed most people were banged up, but like they were okay. I even thought my friends were back in school. Like I was so sure because who survives a plane crash? Like if if one person is alive, then it couldn't have been that bad. That means most people, that means it was like just a, like it was like a, like the plane crash landed as opposed to crashing from the air. So, so I really thought like I was just one of the most hurt people out of that accident. Realizing the truth just kind of shifted my perspective entirely because up until that point, I really was also getting to a place where I was starting to feel sorry for myself and feeling kind of left out of like the world and left out by like my friends moving on with life and with school and, you know, being seniors, going to prom, things like that. So like my entire perspective changed because I realized contrary to what I thought about being in the worst situation, I was ironically actually in the, like the best case scenario because mm -hmm. no one else survived, just two people survived this. So even though I was so hurt and in so much pain, this was actually the best case scenario because the other scenario was literally death. And I think for me, that was the most important thing to realize because it helped me to realize that, you know, this is actually like, it helped me to kind of grasp the miracle that my life really was mm -hmm. and um, to stop feeling sorry for myself, to stop feeling like, you know, um, you know, the world is out to get me or something, you know, like, why would this happen to me? Um, it was just more like, wow. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I had to now consider the amount of loss that everyone was going through. You know, all these parents of all these kids who had been reaching out to me all these months, praying for me and making sure I was okay. Now I realized they had lost their kids. Mm. And so it made their, their like communication with me that much more meaningful because I could now see mm -hmm. from their eyes, you know, they lost their kids, but to them, they felt like my life was one good thing mm -hmm. that came out of this. And so they were holding on to it just as much as my family and I was. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh my God, perspective in every way just completely shifted. Mm -hmm. But I think the main thing for me was also faith. It was like, that was the most important moment for me to kind of understand what God really was going to mean to me. Mm -hmm. Because up until that point, I was learning a lot of things about him that were great. And this was not adding up. So um, I had a lot of conversations with my mom, with my family about how to, how, you know, to to kind of adjust my perspective on on God and um, stop seeing him as just like this, you know, problem solver, you know, you asking for something like a transaction and he gives it to you and, you know, being a Christian thinking it exempts you from like, you know, bad things happening to you that that's not, that's not reality, you know, and God is actually who you go to when bad things happen. He's not the cause of the bad things, you know? So, so just a lot of perspective changes really just born from that one realization, I think. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much, I think how it just kind of changed my entire world. You know, I see a big message for you, uh, from you, for people who've experienced trauma or loss or incredible suffering, because sometimes those, you know, those crosses that we bear start to define us and you're saying, no, no, that should not define you. So for those who are watching right now, who are going through pain or suffering, loss, trauma, Kechi, what do you want to say to them? To anyone who has gone through trauma, whether it's trauma that's as visible as mine or is invisible because, you know, invisible trauma is still as valid. I would say that I understand. I totally understand how difficult it is to not allow something that has affected you so deeply to define everything that you do. Mm -hmm. But from my experience, and, you know, I can only talk to you based on my experience with trauma, from my experience, it is possible for you to, rather than see this trauma as something that cripples you, mm -hmm. it can be a source of strength for you. Mm -hmm. For me, it was something that allowed me to kind of um, develop a new purpose. What I mean is, after going through what I went through, you know, these scars and then the loss of all those lives and everything, I decided that... I would use what has what has affected me, what has happened to me to kind of show people that it's possible 
to live life, to thrive even mm -hmm. after trauma, that there is life after trauma and it doesn't have to be a life defined by that trauma. So I wanted to be that example, not just to say the words, but to show people in the way that I'm living my life that it is possible to live a life that is not defined by your trauma. Mm -hmm. Now, this does not mean that you cannot, you know, um, kind of uh, take what you've gone through to help another person. That's a whole different um, way of like, you know, um, of handling trauma. And I know a lot of people who have done that, including myself, mm -hmm. you know, people who have taken what they've gone through and try to use it as a teaching point for other people mm -hmm. so that either they don't go through what you've gone through or you can teach them how to go through what you've gone through because it's so similar. Mm -hmm. But I feel like also um, a lot of times when you try to draw strength from what you've gone through, it ends up leading you to a purpose that you may have never thought you had. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happened for me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, living my life for not just myself, but for all those who passed away, especially my friends, mm -hmm. and most especially for the parents of those kids that passed away, has led me to so many different places that I could never have imagined, including whether it's school, graduating, working, going on America's Got Talent, traveling, singing. I mean, I feel like all these things stem from the fact that my life became this um, kind of like a testimony really for everyone else that passed away. And I wanted to live for them and make them proud. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's one perspective you can take on like, you know, personal trauma. Mm -hmm. But another perspective is always to also understand that your life after trauma does not have to be one that's defined by it. Mm -hmm. It does not have to be one that um, makes you hide away from the world, but it can be one where you keep living your life despite what you've gone through. Mm. And just by doing that, you have no idea the amount of people you can impact because just doing that shows everyone else that it's possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that's the best mess, the best advice I can give you really, because I mean, no one knows what you're going through except you, mm. but I think that the way that you go through it, you know, um, makes all the difference. So I encourage you mm -hmm. to um, draw strength from your tragedy, from your trauma and, um, maybe possibly you'll encounter your purpose there too.